this time, we are now joined by the Trailblazers' new play-by-play announcer, and that is going to be Kevin Calabro. He joins us via phone. Kevin, how you doing this afternoon? Good, Jordan and Michael. What's going on? Just breaking down some Blazer action. And Kevin... Is it that time? Is it that time to break it, down Blazer action? <laughs> it's getting there. I just sitting here telling Michael, we're two weeks away from the preseason, believe it or not. And many people are familiar with your most recent work calling radio NBA national games, of course. My question for you is, what's the biggest change for you when you go from covering the league as a whole to now focusing in on one team, as you will with Portland? Well, the travel is going to be easier, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, and it's nice to be traveling with a group and emotionally have an investment in a club rather than just parachuting in and doing a game and then you know moving on to the next city. So I think that, for me, that's the biggest difference. Uh, and it's something that I look forward to, you know, being involved in the organization uh, in all phases and uh, the day-to-day operation, uh, the travel, the practices, so forth getting to know the players, getting to know the staffs of these teams. You know, you really don't get a chance to to learn a great deal about the players as people uh, when you're doing the national broadcast. So that, I think, is going to be the biggest component of doing the the broadcast for for a team again, as I did in Seattle for so many years. You know, Kevin, does it change, you know, your preparation? You're speaking to, you know, being captive now with a team. Does it change your preparation on game night in terms of how much you need to know about both sides and matchups, or does that remain pretty similar? No, I think it's it's very similar. You have to be very thorough, I think, and and know both clubs very well. Uh, And fans certainly of the team want to know what's the latest uh, and what do you feel about the latest and – what do the coaches feel? What do the executives feel? And what do the players feel about one another? They they feel like, they they assume that you you've got the pulse of the team, and so you you always have to be I think conscious of that. Uh, that I think is is the most important thing to to remember as you prepare for a game. Kevin, you mentioned your many years of work for the Seattle SuperSonics, and. In the NBA, tell us the difference between fan bases because for those of us here in Portland, we're very familiar with just how passionate the fan base is, but it's not like this in every other city. So Portland's one of those truly special cities, I believe, where you get so much support for your team. Right, and you know it's it's your only professional team, and it was in Seattle, remember, uh, when they began operation in 1967. So there's some uh, real feelings uh, that folks have about that first professional team, you know, that has come to town. And so I think the two fan bases are very similar in that regard. You know, the, the longtime Sonic fans, you know, still remember when their dads and their moms had taken them to the games, you know, in the 70s or 60s, 70s, 80s, and over the decades. And, and certainly that is the case in Portland as well. So I would say that that's the, the similarity. And, and because you, you, you know, you, you have a, a smaller market and because you're here in the Northwest where you feel like, eh, maybe people elsewhere around the country have forgotten us. You, you have that sort of that insular feel. It's more of a provincial feel, I think, in Seattle and in Portland. That's what I felt when I came to Seattle in 1987. So you, you tend to band together a little bit more. It's kind of an us against the rest of the world type mentality, which I think is very, works very favorably to the hometown team because that building that has all that emotion, uh, that fervor that you want night in and night out for 41 nights uh, in the wintertime. And, you know, like Seattle, you're going to have some dreary, rainy nights in the winter, and there's no better place to be than in a hot gym, you know, where you're going to go see your friends, your community, and you're sharing uh, those like interests in, a, in an NBA basketball team you've been following, of course, all your life and, uh, and through the course of the season. So I think those those are the similarities, I think, between Seattle and Portland and living here in the Northwest and enjoying NBA basketball, pro ball. What were your impressions of this Trailblazers team last year? Well, just a team that uh, wasn't afraid to experiment. I mean, Terry was plugging guys in, giving uh, folks opportunities, and a lot of them took advantage of those opportunities with four fifths of your starters gone. Obviously, it was a, a chance to just throw it up in the air and see what happens. And uh, CJ, of course, stepped up. I thought he was terrific last year, the most improved, obviously. Uh, and then teaming together with Damian, who you know built again, added an extra layer to his game. Just an outstanding backcourt, and uh, you know the stories were went on and on and on. Guys taking advantage of opportunities. I mean, you know, a heartless crap. And these guys getting playing time, taking charge. Uh, Terry Stotts being very creative in the way he used Mason Plumley, for example. You know, a guy at that size who who knew. You know, he's dealing out nearly three assists a ball game. So a team that took advantage of the position that they were in. They weren't going to make excuses for themselves. Really turned it on in the second half of the season when they started to gel and came up with some fine rotations.
and so forth, and Terry got a feel for his group, what they could and could not do. You know, that's exciting stuff. And I, I really think they can build on that now because, you know, when you get a little taste of that success, uh, you, you just can't get enough. It's pretty heady stuff. So I think uh, we're, we're headed to some really interesting, interesting nights here in Portland on the floor. Kevin, a lot of people think play-by-play, play, you're just – talking about what happens but there there is an art to it as far as the timing goes what are some just tricks of the trade you've learned over your years that you now apply into what you do well because we're doing the television obviously the folks can see the picture they can decide for themselves what they're seeing so i think what you try to do is just add another layer and then lamar Hurd does such a terrific job of understanding the game and instantaneously being able to communicate that with great knowledge and passion and so forth and so he'll add another extra layer and then maybe a third layer to that if we, we give him an opportunity so from a play-by-play standpoint on tv you have to remember you don't need to paint the picture for folks as brian wheeler does so well on radio one of the best in the league and what I was doing for NBA radio for and for ESPN and, and doing the broadcast there for uh, for ESPN radio, you just have to accentuate what folks are seeing. So from a television play-by-play standpoint, just get out of the way, give the score, try to bring people something else, another layer to what they're already seeing on the two. Kevin, I want you to think back on your experience and share with me, there's moments when we cover sports that, we understand we're witnessing something special. Do you have a particular moment that stands out to you as far as, wow, I'm really glad that I'm here to see this right now? Yeah, the uh, 96 series against the Utah Jazz, two terrific Hall of Famers, John Stockton, Carl Malone, and and the Seattle Supersonics featuring Gary Payton and Sean Kemp uh, coming back as they did three years after losing in the first round. Uh, to the Denver Nuggets being the number one seed in the West and losing to the number eight seed, the Denver Nuggets, following that year, losing again to a lower seed to the Los Angeles Lakers. But keeping folks intact, George Carl, they kept around. They added the great Hersey Hawkins to the mix. And then the team caught fire when the 64 wins and then beating a terrific Utah basketball team uh, and a very compelling Western Conference series. And then taking Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls to six games. So, it wasn't any one particular game of the series. It was just that whole year just to see what you know a team can achieve when they really did band together. I felt like there was uh, there was some disunity in, in the squad, when we, and we had some very good teams in the two previous years. But I think when you have disunity, then you're vulnerable to an upset against a team that maybe doesn't have quite the talent, but are playing together, are playing as a unit, playing strong as a cohesive team. Uh, then you, you, you can see what really happens when, you, when you're doing that, and that's that's what happened in the 95-96 season for the Sonics. Great stuff, Kevin. Thank you again. Welcome to Portland. Excited to excited to join you. We're actually going to stick around with you next segment. We still have a couple more stories we want to share. Also, figure out if you've gotten situated in Portland quite yet. I think the traffic will make you feel right at home as you were in Seattle as well, too. Stick around. When we come back on Trailblazers Courtside, we'll be joined okay. by Kevin Calabro again. Last segment, we're joined by Kevin Calabro. We're welcoming him back to this segment as well, too. And, Kevin, you're in Astoria right now. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing out there right now? Well, it's a Rip City Relay. It's uh, the first of five cities in five days. It's a barnstorming tour. Uh, we're having a lot of fun. We we had a big uh, fair this afternoon from 4 until 6 o'clock. Earlier this morning, we were at the Lewis and Clark Elementary School. Uh, enrollment uh, 432, and I think most of them were crowded into the gym, and we had a we had a, a tricycle race. I got to tell you guys, I haven't been in a tricycle race in some time. <laughs> I, I, I miss it badly. I miss the tricycle. I really do. Uh, and I'm I'm thinking about maybe investing in an adult tricycle, but that's uh, that's beside the point. Uh, we so it was that kind of day. We were we were having fun down here in that story. The weather was terrific. The people were great. The seafood, as always, is uh, off the chart. Wonderful. So, so uh, that that was our day today. I think the folks were happy uh, happy with us. A lot of Blazer fans out here. I mean, a lot of Blazer fans showed up for the fair today. Uh, tomorrow we go to Seaside. It'll be the same program. And then to Tillamook on Wednesday before Forest Grove on Thursday and then out to Salem on Friday. So it's uh, it's been, it's been uh, a nice time, and we're, we're on a... We're on a magical mystery tour, as they say. So, Kevin, I guess it's true that once you learn how to ride a trike, you always know how to ride a tricycle? <laughs> Absolutely. Didn't fall off once, Michael. It was on. Lamar and I got into a, you know, we're very comp- very competitive guys, so we raced back and forth. I, and I must admit, Lamar did, did beat me by a whisker. So it, 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 it looked like that. 
it looked like a lot of fun. Kevin, I know you're out at the elementary school today, and, and this is your first experience, I would think, or one of your first experiences being out talking to fans, seeing what their expectations are, what they're excited about. Now, I know at the elementary school, that's the, the younger version of our fan base, but what are people really saying in general about this team and this season? Well, we had a terrific uh, question and answer uh, here at the, the fair. And I think uh, most folks want to know how can they repeat and build upon what they were able to accomplish last year. Uh, one bright young gal about 10 years old asked if this was the deepest Portland play, uh, Trailblazer team that, that Wheels had seen in his 19 years here. And I think he agreed that, yes, it probably is, which, which makes things, I think, very interesting. There were a number of questions about starting lineups, and I think that's why that's interesting because you have depth, you have great competition in camp. Uh, and, and, and Terry, I think, has made it abundantly clear that there are jobs and rotations available. He's, as, I think, anxious to see what happens as, as anybody else. So that, I think, was the general spirit of, of, the, of the conversation and of the questions that we had uh, this afternoon. And then, you know, the question was, you know, how can the team improve? And I think we all agree defensively. Uh, that that's the compartment in which uh, they're going to need some improvement. They were 20th in the league in points allowed, but six in points scored. So yeah, you can you can outshoot some teams, outscore some clubs night in and night out. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, you got to get those stops in the final two minutes of the game. So I think that's that that was the nature I think of most of the the inquiries that were made today. You know, Kevin, when you think about depth and and it has its obvious positive. I mean, you have more talented people to to put into basketball situations. Chemistry always comes into question, too, when you start to either open your reg- open your rotation or, or play more guys. And defense takes trust and longer to develop. So how do you see that playing out with, with the, de- the depth of the roster and the focus on improving defensively? Well, you have length, uh, and you have guys that can guard multiple positions, Michael, as I look at that roster. I think you guys would, uh, would agree with me. That can be exciting from a coaching standpoint because it means you can switch a lot of stuff. Uh, you can you can really make life difficult on the perimeter when you put length on guys. And certainly, look, if you're going to be the best, you got to beat the best. So how do you – let's just throw a hypothetical out there. How do you defend pick and roll involving Thompson, Curry, and Durant? How do you do that? Well, you, you have to have quickness and you have to have length. And it seems to me that the Blazers have an abundance of that. Then you have to have the knowledge – uh, and the willingness to go out and defend, and I, I think they do. I think you, you saw a team that demonstrated that last year, the willingness certainly, uh, the mentality uh, to do that, and now it's just about execution. And I think you're going to get some very good coaching from Terry Stotts. I think he's going to present some very creative ways in order to defend that hypothetical, that pick and roll that you're going to see from a team that won 73 games last year. Uh, you also in the West, I think, have to have – proper matchups for bigs and I'm, I'm thinking of the Oklahoma cities of the world uh, you know when you've got a, a, a guy up front like a Steven Adams uh, w- with the kind of skill set that he has and now they're going to be leaning on him certainly that division is up for grabs with Durant moving on Aladipo coming on at two uh, so so you look at matchups uh, defensively and, and how can you, you best approach those so I, and I think that they they certainly have with a healthy Azili, uh, and there's no reason to you know push him into the fray early. He'll have a lot of time to get himself physically sorted out, no question about that, because you've got guys like Davis. You've got Myers who's coming back from the injury as well, and you know, terrific three-point stroke out there. But these are guys at the five position. You can roll all of those guys in there play. Avino uh, could probably play some five as well, depending on the matchup. So the versatility of the squad, I think, helps you defensively. Kevin, defense, rotation is all very important, but one thing that really caught my eye or caught my ear, which you talked about, seafood. I am very curious, what does a man like Kevin Calabro yeah. order if we sit down together at a seafood restaurant? Chapino. So it's a, it's a, it's a tomato broth uh, with a little bit of wine cooked down into that, and it's got the crab, you've got the mussels, you've got clams, you've got ordinarily it's, a, it's salmon in there that's just gorgeous, and then those big prawns from the Pacific Ocean. And you let that simmer and you let that cook down a little bit with some good sourdough bread. Uh, that's my go-to every time, Jordan. And maybe a little side of pasta. <laughs> Wheels is listening to me right now. Lamar's listening to me right now. and they, they can't wait to go to dinner after listening to that description. Michael, what about you? 
Oh, man, I'm all messed up now. I got so hungry, I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't think. I, I'm a simple guy. I just like some salmon and some vegetables and, 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 a, and a cup of chowder. Or if it's a restaurant that has some good lobster bisque, that might be about as off the path oh, yeah. as I get. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Well, we'll, uh, we'll definitely hit something up when you get back in town. Enjoy the rest of the Rip City Relays. Kevin, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, guys. I appreciate being on the show. Let's do it again. 